Over the past decade, we have all been learning more about the microbiome and its importance in brain health. I foresee a time in the future where instead of saying, not tonight, honey, I have a headache, we might say, not tonight, honey, my pro-inflammatory astrocytes are acting up. Today, we're going to go cellular and learn from a leading researcher about how gut bacteria can cause inflammation. And we're going to learn about astrocytes. New research was recently published in the prestigious journal Nature and describes the role of a new type of astrocyte and how it impacts neuroinflammation. We're joined now by Dr. Francisco Quintana, who led the study from Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Get ready. We're going cellular again with another amazing scientist. Congratulations, Dr. Quintana, on your recent publication in Nature. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. What is neuroinflammation and how does it present in animals? So, you know, inflammation is a natural process, right? It's this redness, it's this uh, heat, hotness that you can uh, detect in tissues, for example, when you have an infection. But it's also what causes tissue damage when you have an autoimmune disease like diabetes, right? When you have inflammation in the pancreas, uh, arthritis when you have inflammation in the joints, or multiple sclerosis, which is the focus of our work when you have inflammation in the brain. So in animals, uh, we have what we call uh, models of multiple sclerosis, right? Where we try to understand how inflammation in the brain is controlled and how we could potentially uh, um, control it therapeutically. What are some of the causes of neuroinflammation? Well, you can have infections, right? Meningitis is a classical example. Uh, nowadays, uh, we're hearing, I mean, a few years back, we used to hear about a, a Zika virus triggering brain inflammation, right? Nowadays, we're starting to hear about the potential for uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, associated coronavirus triggered CNS inflammation. That's one example. Uh, another example is in the context of brain tumors, right? You can have a certain type of inflammation. And finally, uh, in some uh, individuals, there's what we call autoimmune diseases, where the immune response, the immune system, instead of uh, fighting off pathogens, uh, turns against the host and starts to literally attack and destroy the brain tissue. So that's another cause of inflammation, what we call autoimmune diseases. Well, I'm going to shift a little bit more now towards your research that you've published. So let's help our listeners understand what is an astrocyte and where is it located in the body? So astrocytes, actually, the name comes from star. And basically, that reflects the fact that these are star-shaped cells that have been described hundreds of years ago, more than 100, more 100 years ago. Uh, these uh, astrocytes are actually the most abundant cells in the central nervous system, in the brain. Yet, we really are just now, we're starting to grasp uh, their functions in health and disease. So because of that, because of what we know about astrocytes is so limited, uh, the study of astrocytes is one of the focuses of the research in my lab. What role do astrocytes play in the glymphatic system? So that's interesting. They, they seem to be able to regulate, right, the control, uh, the, the flux of fluids in and out of the brain uh, through the uh, glymphatics. Um, that's one important area that has to be investigated. Definitely. And what can you tell us about the role that astrocytes play, particularly in inflammation? So that's interesting. You know, for years, uh, it was thought that astrocytes, they were thought of as kind of very simple cells. They, it was thought that their only function was mostly to keep neurons happy, to provide them nutrients, right? To provide them support. But um, in the context of inflammation, uh, first we started to appreciate that actually astrocytes can boost and drive inflammation. 
And that's very important because so far we have no therapies to actually suppress those pro-inflammatory activities. And those pro-inflammatory activities are important for diseases like multiple sclerosis, but also for other diseases such as Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease. That's why it's so important to understand um, how is it that they promote inflammation. However, the surprise came a couple of years ago when we started to use new techniques to actually be able to look into different subsets or classes of astrocytes. And indeed, uh, that led us to identify very recently a class of astrocytes, which as opposed to what all other astrocytes or many other astrocyte subsets seems to do, this specific class of astrocytes is literally involved in dampening inflammation. This is a protective subset whose function is to actually keep inflammation off the brain. That is so interesting. Uh, my understanding is that your research indicates that this newly identified astrocyte receives signals from gut bacteria, boosting its anti-inflammatory or, like you said, dampening that inflammatory response. Are, have you found that there are specific gut bacteria that are doing this signaling? No, that's a very important point. And that's actually one of the directions where we're moving into now. Uh, what you describe is right. Uh, actually, we recently identified that those anti-inflammatory functions of astrocytes are kind of constantly kept uh, active by uh, the gut flora, right? Those uh, bugs we have in the gut. Uh, and there are several mechanisms at play. On the one hand, uh, bacteria in our gut, they produce chemicals, right? Metabolites, some of which can actually get to the brain and act on astrocytes. Uh, but then uh, what we just discovered is that there are some cells that work as messengers, right? They go from the gut where the bacteria kind of gives them the message to deactivate inflammation. They go from the gut to the brain and they are the brain, they actually transfer and deliver that message. So astrocytes uh, uh, activate all those anti-inflammatory programs. Yeah, I did. I did download and I bought and downloaded your research paper. And it was really interesting to look at all of the images from under the microscope and all the overlays. <laughs> and I felt like I wanted to hire a science tutor to walk me through it all. <laughs> um, but we'll definitely post it in our podcast notes so that people who do have a deep interest in this can go and look at those images, too, because it's quite remarkable. Super. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's very important. And, you know, um, one of the things that we tend to forget, right, like when we study the blood, right, that's a fluid. So cells are kind of like swimming, if you wish, within it. The brain, obviously, as many other tissues, is much more organized, right? So that's why we need to use kind of microscopy and many other things, not to just try to understand what things happen in the brain, but actually where do those things happen within the brain, right? And that's where all those photos, all those images uh, that you liked uh, get to be very important. Can you explain how astrocytes control the glia limitans and blood-brain barrier? Yeah, so they, they, what we, you know, like actually astrocytes uh, can, can have like protrusions, right, that touch uh, really at the border between the brain and, and the fluids that come from the periphery. So they really have the ability to facilitate or, or determine who gets into the brain. The other thing they can do then is actually to react to things that are in the circulation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and in that way, they can sense signals. They can sense what's going on in the periphery, right, outside the brain. And then, if you wish, help the brain adapt its responses in order to match uh, uh, what's going on. And that's important because then one of the things that astrocytes can do is literally, as I said, uh, keep off the brain cells that, you know, in the context of a viral infection, obviously you would like to have them in there because you need them to fight off the virus. But in the context of homeostasis, which is kind of health, right? Uh, you would like those cells to stay out. And that's one of the things that astrocytes seem to do, at least that's one of the things that our work shows they do. 
That is such interesting research. Have you or other researchers identified any faulty astrocytes that are involved in neurodegenerative diseases? Yeah, that's right. Actually, we had um, about a year ago, we identified, also also in another paper that we published in Nature, we identified um, a subset of astrocytes, right? That seems to be driving uh, disease pathogenesis, right? In the context of multiple sclerosis, seems to be driving inflammation. We and others have also previously described um, subsets of astrocytes uh, that seem to be driving neurodegeneration, right? Inducing the death of neurons. So when we look, you know, when we zoom out a little bit, what we seem to, uh, the, the, the image that is kind of emerging is that there are actually not one, but several subsets or classes of astrocytes that seem to contribute to the pathogenesis of multiple diseases. And indeed, several of them can do different, if you wish, bad things or contribute to different aspects of disease pathogenesis. Some of them could be directly uh, killing neurons, right? Some of them might be kind of activating inflammation or inducing inflammation and so on and so forth. So you mentioned that your research is focused primarily on multiple sclerosis. How might your discovery improve conditions for patients? So one of the things you would like to do is it literally ties up with what you just mentioned. One could and, and, and good like to suppress, right, to inactivate those astrocyte subsets that seem to be driving disease and pathology, while at the same time, uh, boost the activity of those astrocytes that limit inflammation. And, and it sounds complicated, right? But in, in, in inflammatory diseases of the periphery, right, what we call autoimmune diseases affecting, um, let's say, the joints or, or, or the pancreas, we are now developing tools in order to control this balance between pro- and anti-inflammatory responses. So what our work is doing is actually identifying literally um, small, uh, identifying targets as a way of um, um, treating inflammation. Mm. And what do we know about the interaction between infections and the, mi- and the microbiome? So that's interesting. I mean, it goes both ways, right? On the Mm -hmm. one hand, there's some reports that now suggest that the microbiome could uh, help you fight off infections, right? And indeed, you might have heard about, for example, patients having a certain type of very recurrent uh, gastrointestinal infections. Some of them have what we call fecal transplants, and actually they seem to improve a lot. Um, but in addition, right, um, some uh, infections can uh, significantly affect the gut flora and then have uh, impair our ability to fight off the infection or actually cause additional problems. Yes, that was really interesting. I was reading through the methodology and I noticed that the mice were given fecal transplants. Is that correct? Yeah, because one of the things we wanted to do is That's part of our studies in trying to understand how is it that the gut flora, right? The gut microbes control the brain. So, and in particular, now trying to get into which are the specific uh, bacteria, right? In the gut that control the, these uh, astrocyte subsets. So that's something that it's very, it's kind of a common technique that we and others use, but it's actually very useful for us to try to identify specific uh, components of the microbiome. And there's some, it's not what we have done, but there's some investigators that, for example, are transplanting the microbiome of patients, right? Of human patients into mice, trying to understand how is it that uh, changes in the microbiome associated, let's say, to multiple sclerosis, to cancer, can potentially, and, um, you know, how, how do they work? How is it that they really contribute to disease pathogenesis? What is the potential impact of your most recent research that was published? So there are two impacts. On the one hand, it identifies 
not only a set of what we would call anti-inflammatory astrocytes, but also identify ways to boost them, right? And that's important because we would like to do that to treat uh, people afflicted by neuroinflammatory conditions. Uh, but it also suggests that similar astrocytes can be expanded, if you wish, in the context of uh, brain tumors. And by doing so, help the tumor escape the immune response, help the tumor escape what would be protective inflammation. And hence, that's also, that's also important. And that's one of the areas where we're moving into. Oh, that was my next question. Where will your research take you next? <laughs> So, so as I said, uh, one of the things we're trying to understand the role of these uh, anti-inflammatory astrocytes in different conditions, including um, um, cancer. And the other thing we're very interested uh, is on the fact that, you know, uh, one of the things that is becoming very clear is that these pro and anti-inflammatory activities of astrocytes, right? are controlled by cell side communication, by the ability of these astrocytes to talk to, uh, with other cells within the central nervous system or with other cells that you know, kind of visit the brain from the periphery. So the problem is that you know, our understanding of those, of those cell cell interactions, right, of that communication and what are the specific molecules that mediate it is very limited. So we have literally over the last couple of years uh, developed a new uh, uh, set of tools that really allows us to investigate, right? How are those uh, interactions in the CNS, in the brain established? How are they controlled by the gut flora? What are their outcomes, right? Do they trigger inflammation? Do they suppress inflammation? And most importantly, to identify what we call um, therapeutic targets, right, in these cell cell interactions, which is basically proteins, molecules that we can target as, as a way of coming up with new therapies for neurologic diseases. So that is a very hot, uh, you know, very active area of research in my lab these days. That's incredible. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? I think that all in all, uh, what I think this shows is how Comp, you know, how complex systems that, you know, from the distances seem to be completely unconnected, right? Bacteria, the gut, and the brain. But our data shows is how closely they are connected. And by doing so, then it highlights how much we have to learn about not only how those connections operate, but also how we can manipulate those connections as a way of having new therapies for uh, important diseases. Well, thank you very much for your time and congratulations again on your publication. Thanks a lot. And thanks a lot for having me here. That was Dr. Francisco Quintana, a professor of neurology at Harvard University and the lead on this important research at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. I can't wait to see how this research might evolve into new therapies for so many different diseases. And that wraps another episode on Looking at Lyme. I'm your host, Sarah Cormode. Remember, stay safe in the outdoors. Outdoors.